Hello, I'm Dr. Amanda Furiase. I'm the Assistant Professor of the Digital Humanities at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm here today to present my latest work titled Reprogramming Reverence, Diasporic Futurism and Digital Historiography. Thank you for inviting me to this great conference, and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Thank you. Is the archive dead? If so, what is the task of the historian in the aftermath of the archive's end? Responding to this question, this presentation explores how digital media has fundamentally altered history and our engagements with the past. From RAM to ROM, memory imbues computer hardware with its most basic power, the power to remember. By giving humanity a power once reserved only for the gods, Digital media enables us to recognize trends, make predictions, and intervene into our futures. Yet underlying these interventions is a critical flaw. Computer memory only remembers through regeneration. Put differently, data storage devices are repetitively rewritten, saved, and upgraded to remember. Thus, digital media does not merely store the past in its servers but digitization transforms the materiality of archived materials into ephemeral and fleeting moments in time, producing radically new engagements with our past, which challenge the archive's dominance over history. In the aftermath of the archive's end, what then is the job of the historian? Perhaps in order to better understand the answer to this question, we need to go back to digital media's beginnings. Digital media begins with the nation's first air defense system, the semi-automatic ground environment, or SAGE. SAGE played a crucial role in the development of basic computing ideas and infrastructure. The idea itself was fairly simple, in that it consisted of a large and expansive network of radar that detected incoming missiles and transmitted that information back to a centralized direction center. SAGE transformed the United States into what Paul Edwards has described as, quote, an air defense bubble. Yet as simple as this concept was, in theory, it required more than $20 million annually to complete and took more than 13 years to finally build. Central to the project's completion was the development of a concept fundamental to modern computing today, memory. Rather than use storage tubes, SAGE used hard magnetic material as transformer cores to store bits of information. Electric current pulses sent in some of the wires through a core, allowing the direction of the magnetization in that core to be set in either direction, thus storing a 1 or a 0. Magnetic core memory was a watershed development in the history of computing since it dramatically improved the efficiency and speed in which data could be stored, read, and written, and would become the first step toward what is today known as RAM. Prior to the development, the storage process was very unreliable and subject to variation. Magnetic core seemed to provide no limitations in its capacity, eliminating the problem of state decay and the constant need for refreshing. In stark contrast to storage tubes, which were their predecessor, they operated according to regeneration and needed to be constantly refreshed. However, there seemed to be, with the magnetic core, no gradual deterioration in performance over time. The promise of magnetic core memory, however, would quickly be supplanted with the invention of the transitor-based semiconductor memory and the integrated silicon RAN chips of today's computers. Faster, smaller, lighter, and more economical, semiconductor memory sacrificed the permanence and reliability of magnetic core memory for speed and efficiency. A memory refresh circuit, circuit periodically rewrites the data and restores the capacitors to the original charge to offset the leaks on the capacitors attached to the electrical charge. In the end, speed would win the day, with most computers today entirely dependent on these very volatile devices, which degenerate rapidly and need to periodically be refreshed and updated to prevent data loss. While semiconductor chips are inherently regenerative, developers of the silicon chips of today 
took the concept of regenerative memory and described their storage devices as simply memory. The loss of modifiers in turn meant that all data storage devices would now be known simply as memory. Like its more reliable magnetic predecessor, semiconductor memory would simply be known as memory. As a result, the fact that semiconductors are dependent upon constant and unavoidable degeneration was obfuscated. Their inherent volatility was completely annulled. Instead of warning people about their inherent volatility, integrated silicon chips ushered in a renewed promise of a new digital era where data would be stored and accessed indefinitely. In fact, the idea that computers could store data permanently would become a divining narrative undergirding digitization movements. By the early 2000s, digitization was being celebrated and marketed as a tool to save materials and content that was threatened with eventual decay and degeneration. These efforts tended to converge around what many believed to be the ultimate source of decay in society, the archive. In 2004, Google promoted the idea that digitization was imperative for saving books which they presented as inherently vulnerable to decay and launched what is called the Partner Program, announced publicly as, quote, Google Books. The program involved a collaboration with publishers whereby Google actively worked to persuade publishers to scan their books and deposit their scanned text into their database. Google promoted the program as free marketing since it would allow users to sample a portion of the book. Unbeknownst to publishers at the time, Google was also working on a more covert project called the Library Project, which attempted to digitize university archives. The University of Michigan was among the first universities to agree to digitize its entire collection of more than 7 million archived books. Stanford soon followed behind Michigan and agreed to digitize their entire collection. However, for many, the partnership seemed too good to pass up. However, for many, the program seemed to represent an infringement of copyright. In response to growing criticism, Google stressed that the program was intended for research and preservation. The debate, debate eventually progressed into a lawsuit between the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers, which sued Google for copyright infringement. In 2011, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York rejected the proposed settlement between the Association of American Publishers and Google, arguing that Google's process of digitalization was inherently transformative. The judge found that, quote, Google's use of copyright works is highly transformative and that Google digitizes books and transforms expressive text into a comprehensive word index that helps readers, scholars, researchers, and others find books. Furthermore, the judge claimed, quote, Google Books has transformed book text into data for purposes of substantive research, including data mining and text mining in new areas. From the perspective of the U.S. District Court, Google was not simply storing and preserving archival materials and extending the lifespan and accessibility of text-based archives, but they were creating something entirely new. The court's astute recognition of digital media's unique capacity to transform text-based media exposes a central problem at the heart of digitalization. The computer does not merely store, but rather refreshes the past through a volatile process of degeneration. Digital media has consequently ushered in a fundamental change in the process of archiving. In the past, text-based archives used monomic linguistic ordering to categorize information into discrete names, dates, and categories. Archives are consequently not a collection of stories, but they are instead, quote, what Wolfgang Ernst has described as isolated islands. Archival research, in turn, arbitrarily constructs links between these islands in an attempt to smooth over the inherent disconnections and create unified and cohesive narrative representations. The genius or key to the archive, then, is the process whereby names and dates are assigned to the text-based media, which in turn allows the researcher to build a narrative around those discrete categories of organization. 
In stark contrast to the archive, digital media does not order information by names or categories, but disrupts those existing categories by allowing people to search for pattern-based or textual similar similarities. Algorithms do not simply store, but they reframe and reorganize uploaded material into item sets and association rules, clusters and clusterings, and decision trees, which ultimately aim to find similarities or associative patterns between certain identifying characteristics. In the case of images, Wolfgang Ernst explains that digitalization is not interested in establishing authorship. Rather, the expressed goal is to establish an objective means of describing and identifying pictorial characteristics, including color, motif, form, etc. As Ernst describes, quote, since the comparison of images here is of a simple overlay kind and points of similarity and difference are recorded during the process of comparison, the central criterion is a simple matching process, a visual equivalent of the well-known word search that is a standard feature of every word processing and database computer software. End quote. Put simply, when an image is digitized, it is transformed into a set of quantifiable elements these elements, in turn, become the central means by which the image is organized within a digital database. Whereas the archive once existed as isolated islands of discourse, digitization effectively connects these isolated islands together and takes over the role that the historian once played, determining existing patterns between the uploaded media. Moreover, digital media cannot store media but it can only temporarily suspend its refresh cycle to display sounds and images on screen temporarily. The material is not stored somewhere indefinitely, but it can only be recalled in a fleeting moment in time. It is for this reason that Wolfgang Ernst describes digitalization as, quote, time-based media, since digitalization fossilizes time turning time into a series of discrete sounds and images which are only momentarily suspended on our screens. Yet this fact is commonly obfuscated by the interface, which tricks the human observer into believing that what they are viewing or hearing is in fact enduring. Wendy Chun explains that this process has emotive and powerful emotive impacts on us. Describing this process as one around Updating to remain the same, digital media's constant refresh cycle creates a deep-seated anxiety where the user is always in nervous anticipation of what is about to be animated on their screen, yet the moment that it's animated on screen becomes instantly bored. As Wendy Chun explains, quote, we are forever trying to catch up, updating to remain the same, bored, overwhelmed, and anxious all at once. Digitization, then, is not just time-based media, but it is time-based media that fundamentally disrupts human emotion. Although digitization was and continues to be marketed as a way to extend the archive and increase the longevity and accessibility of archival documents, it has brought an end to the archive. In its place, a new dynamic emotive relationship to knowledge has arisen. This new relationship is one constituted by constant repetition or a recurrent process of forgetting, which fundamentally transforms human perceptions of time and space. We experience this on an emotive level in the form of increased anxiety and boredom. So then in the aftermath of the archives ruins, what then is the role of the historian in an environment where the past is always being forgotten, yet simultaneously projected out at users as an ever-enduring present. In the era of the archive, the historian's role was clearly defined. Create a narrative by linking documents and archival materials with a beginning, middle, and end. Today, digitization has made the historian irrelevant, since digital media simultaneously destroys and regenerates the linkages or patterns between those documents constantly. Calculation has supplanted the historian with its team of bots, servers, electrical currents, and sorcery. Text has become logos and no longer needs the historian's carefully honed organizing skills 
to delineate similarities and differences between documents and archival materials. History, once delineated by narrative, is now reframed into a set of quantifiable elements which can always be calculated. If the archive has ended along with the historian's role, it has left anxiety in its wake. Perhaps the era of the historian has not in fact ended. Rather, the role of the historian has become an emotive one. So if the historian in the digital age should look to ground their work in emotion, what exact emotions should the historian look to cultivate? The work of African and diasporic futurist artists might seem like a strange source of inspiration for historians in the digital age, but futurist movements, while pointed to the future, are ultimately rooted in retelling stories from the past. Moreover, the ret their retellings of the past consciously invoke feelings of awe, reverence, and hope. These emotions are commonly associated with religion. This is a point that futurist artists actively acknowledge as they draw on religious themes, icons, and ritual practices in their work. For example, the work of Brazilian digital artist Geraldo Oliveira actively draws upon religious themes as he repurposes archives. In Humanum Est, Oliveira takes an archival photograph of two African indigenous men and fundamentally transforms it. Oliveira does not merely use digital technologies to recreate or enhance the photograph, but digital distortion techniques are applied to the photograph to create an entirely new landscape. This new landscape projects the two African men into space and places them within the backdrop of the sun, planet Jupiter, and a large white lotus flower. Clouds also surround the two African men featured in the image's center, creating the effect of them floating high above the earth. It looks as though they are a space shuttle, preparing to take flight and travel across the cosmos to the planet Jupiter. The compilation of these different images imbues the image with a sci-fi feel and cosmic reference point while simultaneously drawing on African imagery, cultural customs, and traditions. Although the original image might have been rooted in a particular political and historical context, the digital repurposing of the image emplaces them within a cosmic and universal framework that seeks to invoke feelings of awe. Oliviera invokes this feeling of awe by rejecting Western linear frameworks of time. From the perspective of his art, time is not universal and does not move in one forward direction. Rather, here in this image, we see that time is a subjective, highly emotional experience that can move in different directions depending upon a community or individual's experiences. In contrast, here humanity's potential interplanetary future is occurring simultaneously alongside humanity's indigenous earthly past. Thus, Oliviera is consciously positing a subjective understanding of what the future might hold, and using that as his mechanism or means to look back and retell the past. This unique understanding of time is also amenable to digital media itself, for digital media does not abide by linear conventions of time, but exists within a temporal configuration which collapses the assumed binary between past and future. The sorcery of source code takes the past and projects it back out at the user on their screen in the present as if it were a vision of an imagined future to come. We wait in eager anticipation of the computer's processing of our commands with our necks strained and backs hunched over intense anticipation for the computer to respond to our cursor clicks. This process is only made possible by the conflation of storage and memory, which hides the complex and messy social and machinic relations, which transform our clicks and keyboard strokes in the past into moving sounds and visions in a highly anticipated future. In Oliviera's digital image, this sorcery of digital media is made manifest, for he is pointed to the past while simultaneously and paradoxically pointed to the future. 
Here, Oliveira visualizes this collapsing temporal binary and ushers in a radically new concept of time, informed not just by his understanding of humanity's potential interplanetary future, but also one deeply rooted within African conceptions of time as relational. The two men are eternal because of their relationship to the artist, who not only sees himself in them, but also is astutely aware of those in the future who see themselves in his art. As Oliviera explains of this image, quote, I bring in my art the aesthetics of Afrofuturism, where I rescue my ancestry and reverence for Black culture using historical photographs of African peoples and Black personalities, adding contemporary influences. The idea is to imagine Black people alive, strong, and unique. In the aftermath of digitalization, Perhaps Oliviera reveals that the central task of the historian might just in fact be to usher in visions of imagined futures to come, which invoke feelings of awe and reverence. Should we consciously adapt digital distortion techniques into our methods to frustrate and confuse the hardening of memory, revealing how digital media's conflation of storage with memory fundamentally distorts the past and our relationship with, with it. Ultimately, perhaps African and diasporic futurist artists offer historians in, in a digital age an opportunity to explore how digitization enables communities to turn toward the future via the past and create unique narratives that expose the incongruence between storage and memory at the heart of digitization. In the aftermath of the archive's end, Perhaps it is the job of the digital historian to serve as a beacon of guiding light in the future to come.